you know, deciding whether or not you want to be on insurance panels and take insurance is always a hard decision for most people in private practice. I know it was something that I agonized over for at least a year. But the good news is, is that there's a solution to this. And the solution is practice solutions. There is so much you need to learn about the whole insurance credentialing and paneling process. But if you're looking for a cost-effective way to handle your insurance billing, Practice Solutions takes all of the angst and worry out of that process. It's well worth the investment and a better use of your time. Why spend all your time on the phone talking to insurance companies when you can be seeing clients? So check out Practice Solutions today at practiceoftherapy.com slash practice solutions. They absolutely know what they are doing. This is the Practice of Therapy podcast with Gordon Brewer. This is session number 52 of the Practice of Therapy podcast. Hello, folks. I'm your host, Gordon Brewer, and I'm so glad you have chosen to join us today on the Practice of Therapy podcast. If this is your first time listening to the podcast, welcome, and I hope that you'll find all of this helpful. If you are back for uh, another time, I'm so glad you have decided to follow me and join uh, me in this journey. Um, if you haven't yet already, do take the time to go over and subscribe to the podcast. And that way you'll be able to get to know when the first, when the episode, new episodes come out and you'll be notified by that. And also it'll just keep you in the loop. And I love having people in the loop. And so glad you've joined me for the podcast today. You know, a few things that, um, uh, you know, I'm just so excited about some things that are coming up for the practice of therapy and some of the new things that I'm working on uh, right now. Um, one one of the things that I'm working on and putting together is a finance course or a, just a business finance course for private practitioners. And then I'm realizing as I hear from people and uh, learn from people about their private practice journeys, that that's an area that we just never really learned. You know, just the the whole financial side of how to run a small business and how to do the the practice in, in that way. Um, you know, next week's podcast, um, looking forward to you hearing that. Just got done recording my interview with Billy Robinson, who is a a CPA, a certified public accountant. And Billy is just a fun guy and he's uh, uh, just really personable. Not your, not what you think of as your typical kind of nerd accountant. Uh, but Billy really, um, I'm excited to have that episode come out. But in today's episode, one of the things that we're um, going to be talking about is just uh, insurance billing and taking insurance. And I know that that is a lot, uh, a lot of times that's a hard decision for hard decision for people to make in private practices, whether or not they want to be on insurance panels or do, you know, take insurance as we call it. And um, I know for me, it was an agonizing decision along the way um, just to decide how I wanted to handle that as I moved forward and grew my practice. You know, at one point, I know I was just thinking, okay, I'm going to start weaning myself off the insurance panels and just not take any insurance at all. But when I really started looking at the demographics of my area, of where I'm located, and I think this is a big determinant for a lot of people, I really decided that staying on insurance panels, at least some of the ones that most people are on uh, in our area, um, some of the bigger ones like you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield and Cigna and, and those, I really needed to be um, in order to sustain the practice and, and get the volume of clients that we needed to to make this viable. So, um, but I'll talk some more in this interview about that. I've got today as my guest, Jeremy Zug, and uh, I'm so happy for you all to get to know Jeremy and hear what he's got to say. He has a company called Practice Solutions and um, Practice Solutions their their um their superpower so to speak is insurance billing 
and helping specifically mental health providers with that whole insurance piece, you know, from credentialing to um, getting, you know, getting on insurance panels to follow up on claims and checking benefits for, for people, all of that. They are a turnkey operation and handle all of that for people. And the other thing, too, is that uh, as I've learned about this, uh, um, they're very reasonably reasonably priced for what they do. I've had uh, some billers in the past, and um, I'm doing mine in-house now, but um, in the past, and but, but what they charge is, is a reasonable rate. So, um, But anyway, Jer- Jeremy's going to join me on this on this episode. And so we'll get to him here in just a minute. The other thing I wanted to mention to folks is um, if you haven't gone to the website, uh, the practice of therapy, I would invite you to take a look at the website and, and just poke around and look at the things that I'm, I'm getting up there. Uh, it's uh, practiceoftherapy.com, And in particular, go over and look at the resources page that I've got there. If you'll go to practice of therapy, uh, dot com and just click on the menu where it says cool resources and take a look at those things that I've got there. I'm starting to put together some different um, different resources for people. One that is just really popular right now is the Session Note Helper. And the Session Note Helper is just simply a system and a, a way to do your progress and session notes in a way that is very... Um, friendly to your time. Um, what I did is I took the, the tools from um, Google G Suite um, using Google Forms and Google Docs and and linking those two um, those two elements of Google G Suite in order to have a uh, a form based um, uh, therapy note or, or progress note so that uh, you just go through and click off or check off on your computer screen boxes. And what that does is generates a a narrative uh, for your session note. And then you can also go back in and edit the the session note and all of that. And it just cuts your your session note or your progress note writing uh, time exponentially. And I use it all the time for myself. But what I did is I put together and teach you with this system. I give you the... uh, the, the session note helper, I give you the te- the two templates that I use, the Google form and the Google doc template, and that's included in the session note helper, uh, and along with the tutorials of showing you how to set it all up and use that tool and then customize it to your own practice. So I uh, invite you to go over and take a look at that. And you can just go to the, the URL session note helper Dot com and that'll take you directly to the page, the landing page for that. So um, just wanted to point that out to you and let you know that that's available if you didn't know about it. So um, I'll quit rambling about all that stuff. But uh, anyway, here is my interview with Jeremy Zug from Practice Solutions. So without further ado, here is Jeremy. <music> Well, hello, everyone, and welcome again to the Practice of Therapy podcast. I am so thrilled to have with me today Jeremy Zug. And Jeremy and I, again, this is one of the, uh, uh, Jeremy is one of those Joe Sanok groupies that I happen to run into every now and then, and that we've got uh, a lot of mutual parallel paths here with uh, with Joe's stuff. And uh, and Jeremy reached out to me to talk to be able to come on the podcast and I was thrilled to have him. So welcome, Jeremy. Yeah. Thanks, Gordon. So yeah. happy to be here and uh, chit chat with you for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So Jeremy is the person behind Practice Solutions, which is an organization that provides uh, uh, billing and credentialing support. Have I got that right, Jeremy? Yeah, that's right. That's right. We uh, we provide support for all kinds of different practices on the billing and credentialing end. Yeah, well, good. So as I start out with everyone, Jeremy, just tell folks a little bit about your private practice journey and how you've landed where you are and doing what you do. Yeah, so my private practice journey started in Chicago. I was going to school uh, to get a, a bachelor's in counseling. 
Um, and I thought it might be enriching to work in a private practice. Um, and of course, you can't do any clinical work um, without a degree. So they stuck me in a billing role. Um, and so I worked at a group practice in downtown Chicago and absolutely loved the billing work. And I found that the therapist absolutely hated doing the billing work. <laughs> and uh, from, from there, this idea blossomed of, of helping other private practices run effective billing processes and, and credentialing processes. And so that was really, that was really it, right? Worked in community mental health before college, uh, started at 14 in community mental health. That was an enriching experience in a lot of ways, but then I loved the private practice world a little bit better. So decided to start practice solutions and here we are. Yeah. Wow. That's a, that's, that, that's, that's always fascinating to me how people get where they are. Yeah. Yeah. We all get here somehow. Um, and yeah. it, they all seem to be very colorful, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Jeremy, um, you know, I know we had chatted before we started recording just about several different ways we could go. But one of the things that I think most people might be interested in is um, if they're thinking about being on insurance panels and or they are just totally frustrated with being on insurance panels. Um, what are some of the things you've learned so far about helping people get more efficient with that and having all that run better? I, and I guess maybe a place to start is why would anybody want to go on insurance panels versus just being strictly private pay? Because hands down, you know, strictly private pay is easier I mean, there's no doubt about that, and I don't think anybody would argue with that. But, um, yeah, so your thoughts on all that? Yeah, so this, the starting question, why would somebody want to be on an insurance panel? Uh, and also, I, I completely agree. Private pay is absolutely easier. But some of the benefits of being on an, on an insurance panel, right? So, obviously, the being on a network or a panel is good for marketing, but it also makes the cost of therapy more affordable for the patient. Right. That's an important factor, right? The fact that somebody could come in and pay $20 a session versus $225 or $150 or whatever your rate is, is, is attractive, is appealing. But there's also this myth that runs around that you have to be on a panel in order or on multiple panels in order to grow a successful practice. And that's just not true. Mm -hmm. One thing I would say is to make this easier, one, I would, I would ask around and find out which panels are the, the better reimbursing ones. Now, obviously, you can't find out the, the fee schedules because it's not, not legal to ask for the fee schedules, but you can get a range of, of what insurance companies typically charge. And then I would look at where you plan on going with your private practice. What are your goals and, and dreams, right? Because the bigger you get, the more expenses you're going to incur. So, you know, let's say insurance company X pays you $60 a session, that may be fine while you're a solo provider, but as you grow or have more expenses, your margin and your profit are going to shrink on that, right? So you want to be very cognizant of that moving forward. Right. I would also say which panels are easier to work with, right? You know, there are certain insurance companies that are just difficult to work with. And mm -hmm. if if the money is not worth the pain and suffering of doing that, um, then I, would, I wouldn't recommend it. The, the last thing I would say is um, I would track how many patient referrals you, you receive on a weekly or monthly basis that belong to a certain insurance company and go by volume. So I would almost do a, a triple Venn diagram. I would do ease of interaction or ease of experience for the insurance company, reimbursement, and then total patient referrals that belong to an insurance company, right? So if you can picture a, a tri-Venn diagram, um, whatever falls right in the middle is what I would go with. Right, right. Yeah, and I know that's uh, that's one of the things I've been looking at here lately with my own practice and just really kind of, you know, get, getting an idea, okay, what's my average reimbursement rate? You know, what's... Uh, you know, what am I getting paid for each different CPT code from the different insurance companies? And then also, like you mentioned, the volume of the of the business. I've, you know, I know I've got one insurance company that is probably makes up maybe three fourths of the of the of the business that we do or the the patients that we see. And so that's the one that 
I guess we need to focus on the most in, in terms of, yeah, you know, base, base our numbers way. more on that one. That's a great way to look at that, right? Because if you're turning away, let's say that, I don't, I don't know what a average client load is for you, Gordon, but let's say you get 100 patient referrals for Blue Cross Blue Shield in your area. That, that would get my attention. Mm-hmm. It would certainly get my attention, right? And then you got to look at what are you willing to do financially, right? Because you're obviously going to take a hit on, on your, your cash rate, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, nobody's, almost nobody's going to take your cash rate. Uh, or pay you that. So it's, it's worth looking at, you know, I'm going to write off a certain amount of money for each session. And is that worth it? You know, the, the only other option I would say, as far as your interactions with insurance would be out of network billing, which so many people tend to disregard actually. Yeah. Because you can have the payment go to the patient. You can still submit the claim. So you provide this ancillary luxury service in a lot of ways, but still make your cash rate. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you want to, you want to, since we, you mentioned that, you want to talk a little bit about maybe a strategy around that? Yeah, around out-of-network billing? You mean? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So for out-of-network billing, hands down, I would say collect your cash rate from the patient up front. And if you're able to, find out what the out-of-network benefits are for that patient. Because chances are that their out-of-network benefits are pretty decent, you know, we found that with one provider in particular, we recommended that they go out network with uh, a certain insurance company, and they were afraid that their patients were going to have to pay exorbitant amounts of money um, to to do that, right? But it, you know, we found out that the patients only paid three to four dollars on average more per session, but the practice made their full rate, right? Mm-hmm. So essentially, they went from making. Uh, it was like $45 a session from the insurance to 125, right? Uh huh. That's a tremendous leap. So for the same patient, they increased the value of each patient by a tremendous amount. Um, mm-hmm. I, I would look at that. I would look at the out of network benefits for the patient. I would charge the patient a hundred percent upfront and then I would have a uh, payment go to the patient, which most EHRs have a setting for. Right. You'd certainly go that route, but I wouldn't put the practice in any sort of cash flow. Uh, hindrance. That's why I say collect from the patient up front. Yeah. 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 And I know that's a, that's a, um, a, you know, one of the ways that I know for my practice, we kind of handle uh, out of network stuff is that we, um, we also offer a, a sliding scale for mm-hmm. people that don't have insurance or prefer not to use their insurance. And so the, with the sliding scale, I know that with the way I've got that set is that I'm going to get, um, close to the minimum, close to what I would get if it were in network for the minimum amount. And most people are, you know, in the upper, hopefully in the higher ends of the sliding scale. So, yeah. Right, right. And then that way you win on really both fronts. And I think it's valuable, right? I would only, the only other thing I would offer as far as um, in network, out of network, is if there's a certain population you really enjoy working with, right? Let's say you right. really enjoy working with active duty um, or, or veterans, right? Active duty military uh, individuals. So maybe being in the TRICARE panel is really important to you. That's a big part of what you do or your area, right? But maybe you run the numbers and it's not sustainable to have a practice be uh, fully supported by that uh, mm-hmm. by that um, Then maybe you need to cut uh, down a little bit on the TRICARE end and take more private pay patients or Blue Cross Blue Shield patients, right? Right fully support it, but you also want to meet your clinical objectives, right. which that's, for us, it's not all about money, right? It's all about, you know, supporting the practice holistically. Um, and if that's one thing that's important, then that's, you know, something you, you ought to do. Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, so credentialing, I know that was another thing we said we wanted to kind of bullet point. Mm-hmm. You know, I think for a lot of people that is an intimidating process or they think of it as intimidating is maybe they, they figure out because of their demographics that they, it would be beneficial for them to go on some insurance panels. And um, so they start to look at, um, okay, what do I need to do to get on these insurance panels? And obviously the credentialing process is a big part of that. Do you want to say maybe give some strategies around that? Uh, absolutely. The biggest thing that will help you in the long run is being organized. Mm-hmm. So the more organized you are with your license documentation, your resume, previous work experience, 
um, your certifications, right? Uh, mm -hmm. how, you know, however many professional certifications you have, the better off you'll be because the credentialing process is all about proving to the insurance company that you are who and what you say you are. Right. And the best way to do that is through documentation at, at the moment. And, you know, when you go on to the, the account CAQH, right, which is how a lot of insurance companies run the credentialing process, they're going to really care about what's on those applications, right? So the more organized you are in the documentation piece, which I know is boring and makes most people's eyes bleed a little bit, <laughs> uh, but it's really, it's really important that yeah. you create a filing system that makes sense and keeps all the documentation in a, in a row. So look mm -hmm. at what works best for you and maintaining um, your documentation is really important. And then the other strategy I would employ that's really, really important is, uh, well, two, uh, one, consistent follow-up with the insurance companies, right? Edna mm -hmm. can take up to 180 days to process a contract, right? right. Six mm -hmm. months, right? Yeah. You're six months out from having a contract from Edna. Um, so plan accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would say that's really important is proving that your modalities of treatment work, right? Uh -huh. Any evidence-based treatment um, will get you through, even if you encounter what's called a closed panel. So in Michigan, let's say, Gordon, you move to Michigan, you decide to be in this great state and provide therapy here, uh -huh. and you apply to priority. Well, chances are you're not getting on priority, right? Um, or any priority panel. But if you can prove that look, this patient or this demographic of people come to me and I can prove treatment outcomes, that says a lot. And uh -huh. often insurance companies will reverse a decision when it comes yeah. to a closed panel if you can prove that what you do works. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, one, one little thing that reminded me of one of my clinicians here at my practice, Krista, when she came on, and there's one, uh, one panel that's fairly big in our area, Cigna, uh, their panel was closed when she came here, but uh, because of her persistence, she was able actually able to talk to someone at Cigna that could make the decision. And uh, you know, as as cheesy as this sounds, she just basically sweet talked him into letting her be on the panel, and it worked. And so, um, you do what you got to do to get on these uh, do on the you know, these panels. You know, obviously, you got to be ethical and not. That's, That's right. Funny, but, uh, but um, yeah, so I mean, if it works, it works. That, that's absolutely right, Gordon. Yeah, yeah. Don't bribe anybody. That wouldn't be good, right? Or use extortion. But, you know, I think that's why I would say that your why for being on a panel is really important. Mm -hmm. You have to believe that you want to be on these panels because it is kind of a slog, right, to deal with insurance. It's, you know, it can be a headache and following up on claims and denials and rejections mm -hmm. and a lot of people can lament the, the ills of taking insurance, but it can be done in a way that is gratifying and, and edifying to the practice and the folks that are on the panel. Uh, but you have to really believe in being on the panel, right? right. Let's say you know, a new provider comes on, on the scene or you know, wants to start their own practice, coming out of CMH or, or what have you, uh, and they get on every insurance panel. Well, they're going to hate being in private practice. You know, fundamentally, right. they're just not going to like it because it's going to be bureaucratic and a lot of paperwork and then maybe not even pay off in the long run. Mm -hmm. so really choose wisely your, your panels because it'll determine, you know, your quality of life in your practice. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I've learned, uh, learned that. Uh, yeah, like I, like I tell folks that are listening to, to me, I've learned a lot the hard way and I don't think they have to. <laughs> yeah. No, certainly yeah. not. And there's plenty of resources out there to help you. Right. So right. This is stuff you can certainly DIY, right? Mm -hmm. You can do it yourself, you know, credentialing and billing. Um, and for most folks, I think, you know, that are in the solo world um, can and, and yeah. still maintain a decent caseload. There does get to a saturation point, though. Yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, that, that's a great segue as to telling folks how, um, you know, kind of how you've got practice solutions set up and, what you guys do that helps with that. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm listening in and taking notes because I'm, I'm at a point where I need to make some changes, Jeremy. Indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so how we got into this, uh, I worked in CMH uh, in high school um, and started to work with patients at like 18, worked at a group home and, and day treatment. Um, I was a day treatment staff. It was a really exciting time. Um, but fast forward 
five years after college, we had just started practice solutions because a lot of those folks from CMH said, well, we don't really know what we're doing, right? It was a couple of folks that I had worked with before. They wanted to launch into private practice. They're you know, talented therapists, uh, knew a lot of stuff and knew a lot of people that, that needed help, but they didn't know what they were doing. They knew they needed to be on panels in their area, which is absolutely true. And so they, they said, hey, can you, can you do this stuff for us? And if you can, we'd love it. If you were an LLC, so our insurance will cover it if something happens. And we said, yeah. So it was only, you know, Practice Solutions was only supposed to be for like five therapists in Montana. Um, and it blossomed from there. Um, but what we found was that we were able to save that group of five people eight to 10 hours of work a week, which is a whole day. Right. I mean, yeah. you can win back a whole day. And, and Gordon, your time, eight hours of your time is far more valuable than you calling insurance for denials and rejections. And that's how I. Yeah, that's exactly how I phrase the value here is if you were spending, let's say you're spending two hours a day or an hour a day, even calling insurance or dealing with the billing, it's not worth your time. Mm -hmm. Right. Because your time is far more valuable. Right. I don't know what your rate is, Gordon, but. You know, most people can't afford eight to 10 hours of your time, right? And uh -huh. that would be insane, right? But you can replace eight to 10 hours with patients and more than, you know, more than cover the cost of what it would be to, to outsource or hire somebody to do this stuff, right? Right. Um, right. And that's far worth it. Yeah, yeah. And it's, um, you know, it, as, as I um, begin you know, and I say this to people a lot, you know, you really have to look at your return on your investment. And the bi the biggest asset that any therapist has is their time and expertise. And that's what we, that's what people buy from us to put it in kind of that context is they, they buy our time and our expertise. And uh, the more clients you see, if you're spending time on doing things that, um, aren't bringing any return on your investment of time, um, probably need to look at how you can restructure that. That's true. And, and there's a lot of ways to do this, right? So you can outsource to a company like Practice Solutions, right? And, and there's a lot of ways to do that. You can have an admin come in part-time, right? Some college student or you know, somebody who's looking for part-time work to come in. There are mm -hmm. pros and cons of that as well. Um, or you can, you know, have your clinicians do it yourself or have you do it yourself, right? Uh, but only if you win on this stuff, right? You don't want to lose. And I, I right. appreciate, you know, your focus on return on investment because you can outsource, you know, these tasks to somebody or a company to do them and you can still win. Right mm -hmm. now there's an expense there, of course, right? Yeah. But if you have a plan to make up for the expense or even profit off of that, then good for you. You ought to do it. <laughs> right. Right. And the bottom line is if it, if it helps you collect on um, claims that you wouldn't normally get, it's absolutely worth it. Yeah, I would agree. And even for our company, right, we, we outsource some tasks too, right? So for example, HR, we outsource HR to a, to a company that gave us a good deal and, and it saves me at least 15 to 20 hours a month mm -hmm. on HR tasks. That's totally worth it. 15 yeah. to 20 hours of my time is much better spent on other things, you know, training folks here or, you know, talking to Gordon uh, than, than they are other places, right? right. To right. me, it's entirely worth the expense. Right, right. Yeah. So um, tell us, uh, I guess, maybe a little more in detail if folks were to say you've got, say there's uh, somebody out there that is, um, they've got a solo practice and they're, really finding that they're spending, you know, a day, half a day on having to do insurance claims and follow up on, you know, rejected claims and all that sort of thing. And maybe just getting overwhelmed with that whole side of things. What, how do you guys work with folks to, to help them out with that? So we take all of that off their plate, right? So from, from posting payments to following up with the insurance company on denials or rejected claims to verifying eligibility to sending out patient statements, you know, all and credentialing, obviously. Our whole goal is to look at the practice and see this key business process as ours, right? Mm -hmm. as, as our responsibility to fully execute from start to finish and then report to the practice owner 
on the state of their billing, right? State of the union. It's like, well, here's where your billing falls, right? And and our job is, you know, purely revenue cycle management. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is we want to own that key process, but also show folks what's going on, right? Because the right. problem is that people outsource this task or give it to somebody else, and then they don't know what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. They don't know if it's being done or if they're you know, following up really, or how they're tracking this stuff, or if claims are getting submitted or, you know, whatever, because you work with people and people are fallible in a lot of ways. Right. Um, so for us, what we want to do is show people, you know, show our work essentially, right? It goes back to like that first grade principle of, you know, solve the problem, but show your work. Right. You know? So that's, yeah. that's what we do is we show our work and we want to take that process off of people's plates completely. Right. Yeah. That, that is the objective. Right. Right. Well, that makes sense. And it's, uh, I know, uh, I've done, we, we, I've, I've gone through several different ways of doing what I do. And, and, um, it really is, does come down to figuring out those tasks that, um, the more that you can take off your plate and, and delegate that really doesn't, um, you know, I'm, re I'm, I'm sorry I'm jumping around here, but I just got through uh, the, a lot of folks might have listened to earlier episodes that I did with Mike Michalowicz, who wrote the book Profit First and his newest book Clockwork um, with uh, really just teaching folks how to run a business like Clockwork. And a big, the biggest part of it is figuring out those tasks that you really don't need to waste your time on of really giving them to somebody that really could actually do them better than you could, even though you might think you could do it better, uh, actually giving it to people that have the expertise and the knowledge of doing those things. And so, yeah, and that's, uh, that's the thing that's exciting to me about what you're doing uh, with practice solutions. Well, thanks, Gord. I, I appreciate that. And I would say the you know, if I had to make a last comment here, right, when I was hired by a group practice to do this stuff, um, you know, really what we tried to work on and we did work on was building an atmosphere of trust, right? Because you, you hit on a good point, right? A lot of folks don't want to give up these things because they think they can do it better or, or in order for them to be done, they have to do them, right? Right. And if you develop a, a team, a teamwork mentality and develop relationships with the folks that are doing these tasks, really you won't have a problem, mm -hmm. right? You shouldn't have a problem. Even, even when things get missed or mistakes get made, if you develop a good relationships with people on your team that do these tasks, uh, they'll, they'll get done, right? And, right? and really, really hard, right? Because you work tooth and nail and scrape and you know, do whatever you can for your practice. And then somebody comes along and doesn't do something the way you would have done it or what have you. And it gets really frustrating. Um, and I would say develop, develop trust on your team, right? right. Develop the teamwork thing and, and you'll be okay. Right. Right. Well, that's a, that's so great. Yeah. So Jeremy, tell folks a little bit more about how they can get in touch with you and what you've got available through practice solutions. I believe your website is practice sol S O L. Uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah the domain is practicesol.com, and then yeah, if you hear of us through through the podcast today, there's um, there's a landing page uh, here available, and so feel free to fill out the form, and you'll get in touch with us, and we'll we'll evaluate you know what the needs are of the practice, and and mm -hmm. if we can help out and take some of that time and and give it back to you, uh, and that's that's really the best way to do things is uh, either go through the website or go through the landing page here and. Um, we'll get in touch with us and we'll, yeah. uh, we'll see if, if we're the right fit and if we can really help out. Right. And I'm confident that, you know, our team can do a good job on this stuff and, and yeah. really help you regain a lot of the ground here. Right. Right. And I know we had talked with your, one of your people, uh, uh, Jesse about that landing page and I'm sorry, I don't have it right in front of me, but I'll definitely have it in the show notes and mm -hmm. be sure to put it in the intro and extra, extra, uh, Extra, 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 whatever <laughs> of this of this episode, so people will have that um, of being able to get to that that specific landing page. So, other other parting thoughts here, Jeremy. Before we, I want to be respectful of your time and uh, all of that. So, what what else would you want folks to know uh, that's important stuff, whether fun or important? 
Well, that's a that's a really good question. I would say the the important thing when looking at outsourcing any of these tasks, right? And this can go for either you know the billing or or other tasks um, is is purely fit, right? Mm-hmm. Are they going to be a good fit, right? I, I think that's the most important thing. When we look for people here at at our company, we look for chemistry, the three C's, right? Chemistry, competence, and character. Mm-hmm. I would say the most important out of all those, it would be chemistry, right? Yeah. Make sure that you're working with people that you really enjoy working with and that are good fits. Uh, and you'll, you'll most likely enjoy things even when it's not fun to go to work or, you know, yeah. you have a bad day. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, I, I tell you, if, if, if anybody goes into work every day and they absolutely dread going into work, they really need to take a hard look at that. And um, because I think... Uh, like I've said, hurt people have heard me say before. One of my good friends always says, "If it ain't fun, it ain't worth doing." So there you um, go. <laughs> I totally agree. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, Jeremy, for being with me today. And uh, again, folks, if you'll take a look at those show notes, and we'll have those links for getting in touch with Jeremy, and definitely go over and check out Practice Solutions because I think. Um, they're good. They're good people. I've known Jeremy for a little while now, just through our social media connections and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, I, I can really recommend them. So take a look at all of that. Take care, folks. Well, folks, I hope that this has been great information for you. I know that, as I said in the beginning, you know, deciding whether or not you're going to take insurance is usually a big step for people, and uh, it doesn't have to be hard, and that's one of the reasons that I really like this resource, Practice Solutions, and I really believe in it. I think it's a good way to go. I wish I, I wish they had been around when I first went into practice because I definitely would have taken advantage of their services early on. Um, you know, the other thing I wanted to mention that uh, just uh, kind of put out there as a little bit of a bullet point um, thing that Jeremy had mentioned is is don't overlook the the benefit or the idea of, of accepting out of network benefits. And the way that you can do that is just simply by um, letting the, the client pay you your fee on the front end and then you file their insurance um, with the insurance company as an out of network provider. And usually more uh, many times the out of network benefits are pretty significant for people. And so they're able to uh, reap the benefit of that. And it just uh, in your marketing, your practice, and when people ask if you take insurance, um, that way you can say, yes, we take insurance, but I'm out of network for that provider, but we can check into your out of network benefit. So that's um, the one thing, one, one reason that a lot of people choose to go on to insurance panels and they decide to accept insurance is that it does give you more clients. Um, because I think that's one of the, uh, un- unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately is one of the big um, reasons that people choose the therapist they choose is whether or not they're um, able to take their insurance. So think about that, chew on that one for a while. And, uh, uh, let me hear from you. I'd love to hear from you. You can always email me at gordon at practiceoftherapy.com. And I'm glad to get those emails. Um, do check out uh, Practice of practice Solutions um, uh, resources. They, they're a great company, and I really like them a lot. And I've got that, made that link hopefully a little bit easier for you. If you just go to practiceoftherapy.com slash practice solutions, and that will get you there. You can also go directly to practice solutions page at practice sol, um, dot com, practice sol.com and, um, use forward slash Gordon and that'll get you to my landing page on their, on their website. And they'll, um, we've got this little relationship going on and I like it. So, um, use that if you will. So take care folks. Thanks again for listening to the practice of therapy podcast. Uh, I'm so glad you've been with me. Do take the time to go over and subscribe to the podcast, wherever you might be listening to it, whether it be on Apple podcast, iTunes, or Stitcher, or Spotify, or Google Play, 
wherever you might be listening to the podcast and take the time to to give us a review. I love reading the reviews and love to get people's honest feedback on the podcast. And uh, it also just helps us boost our rankings and makes it easier for other people to find us as well. So take care folks and uh, look forward to uh, talking, being in your ears and in your world next week. Thanks. You have been listening to the Practice of Therapy podcast with Gordon Brewer. Please visit us at practiceoftherapy.com for more information, resources, and tools to help you in starting, building, and growing your private practice. If you haven't already, please sign up to receive the free private practice startup guide at practiceoftherapy.com. The information in this podcast is intended to be accurate and authoritative concerning the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, guests, or producers are rendering legal, accounting, or clinical advice. If you need a professional, you should find the right person for that.